Welcome to the Google Cloud IT Heroes Summit. We are so excited to be here with you all today around the world to talk about how you can unleash your optimization superpowers with Google Cloud. Let's kick off by welcoming Sahana Sama, who leads our global cloud value advisor team to share the top strategies to help you optimize your costs. Good morning, delighted to be here with all of you. As cloud value advisors, we work closely with many customers. Our focus is really on helping link a customer's cloud strategy to their desired business outcomes across cost, revenue, or innovation. Today, we find ourselves collectively navigating a highly unusual macro environment, whether it's inflation, labor, disruption to supply chains, and the impact of complex geopolitics. Every company is trying to strike the balance between optimizing cost in the near term with an eye towards future growth given technology trends that are only accelerating, digital commerce, personalization, or hybrid work. As IT decision makers at the world's top companies, you are at the center of this with a critical role in both building your company's business resilience, but also thinking about how to best optimize technology investments. Later today, in the Optimizing for Shrinking Budgets breakout, we're excited to have leading smart home security provider ADT and their IT heroes join us to share how they achieved an incredible 76% reduction in annual IT OPEX costs. Every customer I'm meeting with is asking me how to better manage cloud costs, which are growing year on year, while creating a case for change for the future. I always start with making sure you have the right metrics. The data you need in addition to IT costs are the mix of IT spend between maintain and grow and IT unit economics. It's absolutely critical that IT decision makers have access to this level of data visibility. Based on our customer experience, we see that customers who are successful take three meaningful steps to better gain benefits from their cloud investments. First, optimize infrastructure with flexibility and security. Next, aggregate and migrate disparate data systems. And finally, proactively monitor cloud spend with FinOps. Let's first talk about infrastructure. As we mentioned, you're probably being asked to do more with less. Infrastructure should be resilient to demand, both in flexing up and down. We talk in the press about Black Friday, usually 20x the typical volume but it's also important to have the ability to flex down so that not just your TCO, but that your average transaction costs are lower. Cloud cost optimization requires a balance to spend effectively while keeping performance and scalability impacts to a minimum. This requires a holistic optimization across multiple dimensions. Starting with technology spend, optimizing compute, containers, and serverless along with controls for cloud storage, databases, and analytics to identify and eliminate underutilized resources, labor spend, driving productivity with managed services reduction and increased productivity across infrastructure and data engineering teams that can be redeployed for higher value services, resiliency, revenue loss avoidance from planned and unplanned outages due to lower service reliability, Two examples of services that deliver immediate impact on these areas are Google, Kubernetes Engine, and auto-scaling. Shopify used GKE to help them handle scale with no interruptions. Over the most recent Black Friday, Cyber Monday period, Shopify processed over 5 billion in transactions. GKE also helps optimize costs with several features like auto-scaling. Customers like OpenX are saving up to 45% using GKE. Let's move on to the second lever, unifying disparate data systems. 
Traditional data platforms create bottlenecks that impede transformation, including the challenge of maintaining expensive legacy systems that cannot scale and do not support advanced AI and machine learning use case deployments. Aggregating data breaks down data silos to provide a 360 degree view of what's happening in the business and makes it easier to gain insights. Migrating data to the cloud to create a unified data platform reduces your total cost of ownership by lowering infrastructure, maintenance, data model, and query development costs. These changes accelerate time to value by consolidating data silos, allow real-time business insights, and finally create a cost-efficient platform for AI and ML use cases. PayPal centralize your data platform to achieve 20% cost savings and make faster decisions in the areas of credit approvals. Let's move on to the third lever. I'd like to say technology leaders and CFOs are the new power couple. Let me start with what is FinOps and why do you need it? As you all well know, there are multiple changes in financial governance when you move to the cloud, and there can be up to 30% average wasted spend. Dynamic changes to migration and consumption can challenge budgets. There is limited visibility into usage and source of cost overruns. FinOps is a set of cloud management practices that allow you to optimize cost intelligently and provide the visibility needed to make decisions about resource utilization, from selecting the right machine types to gaining a detailed understanding of current cloud costs and how they will trend in the future. You are not alone. Google Cloud is a large consumer of our infrastructure. In fact, we are one of the largest BigQuery consumers to date. We are constantly learning and refining our own FinOps practices to optimize our infrastructure and data. Our FinOps tooling and practice is dedicated to helping our customers wherever they are in their FinOps journey, whether it's figuring out a cost allocation strategy or deriving the right unit economic measures. We provide this data in such a way that you can take advantage of any in-house reporting tools you may have. Additionally, we offer usage insights showing you where waste may lie within your infrastructure. We are also the first to provide a dashboard for carbon costs so you can track your sustainability achievement. With FinOps, you can accurately estimate new workloads and actively monitor and act on any forecasted cost overruns. Companies who do this right are able to reduce their cloud costs by 20 to 30%. Etsy was seeing spikes in cloud costs when scientists, developers, and engineers were testing new ideas. FinOps tooling and practices have enabled them to save over 40% on their compute costs. We are all looking to strengthen our business resilience today. Organizations that are best able to maximize their benefits from cloud investments take three meaningful steps. First, optimize your infrastructure to respond with flexibility and security. Aggregate and migrate disparate data systems. And finally, proactively monitor your cloud spend with FinOps. Thank you everyone and back over to Sally. Thanks, Sahana. Wow, what a great set of actionable insights to help unleash cost optimization. Next up, I'm delighted to be joined by Sachin Gupta, our VP and GM of Infrastructure, and Hen Goldberg, our VP and GM of Cloud Run Times, who will share the hot topics customers are increasingly asking them about and get their advice on where to invest for success in 2023. Over to you, Sachin. Thanks, Ali. Hello, I am Sachin Gupta. Joining me in this conversation on where customers can invest in their cloud infrastructure is my colleague, Hen Goldberg. Thanks, Sachin. I'm so happy to be here with you to discuss our customers and their opportunities to become IT heroes with Google Cloud. Every day, I get the opportunity to speak with customers from organizations of all sizes, from all industries, some cloud first and some traditional. The responsibility to find solutions for some of the world's toughest challenges is put in the hands of IT leaders like yourselves. You are the leaders who have to tackle scaling up your workforce and optimizing their productivity so they can tap into AI to scale and innovate and under shrinking budgets and increasingly complex security and compliance requirements. This challenge is amplified as we are reaching an inflection point for computing and infrastructure where Moore's law is slowing due to physical limitations and rising costs of infrastructure. So how are organizations succeeding in spite of this? 
At Google Cloud, we are reimagining the next generation of infrastructure, a modern infrastructure that allows you to easily unlock innovation today while laying the groundwork for tomorrow's success. One built specifically optimized for your workloads and organization's needs. We're seeing customers use this as their superpower to help IT gain an advantage. Let's start with the hot topic of AI and machine learning. When customers ask me for advice, I suggest asking three critical questions. First, are you solving a net new problem or can you use predefined AI solutions to accelerate time to value? Customers like Coca-Cola use Vertex AI to collect insights and optimize product picks for over 700,000 vending machines. Second, what are your performance and cost needs? If you're tackling a complex challenge, like the one Palo Alto Networks will share later today, you may need to build your own AI infrastructure. We provide infrastructure choice and scale. You can trust you're building on the latest hardware optimized for both performance and cost. Midjourney, a leading text-to-image AI-generated digital art startup, chose Google Cloud because of this. They render stunning images for over 11 million members at breathtaking speed. Finally, how can you turn your AI ideas into a reality despite growing skill gap? AI is in our DNA. We have decades of experience and teams of experts who have chartered AI innovation. We have not only built this into our products and made this available via Google Cloud, but also we are committed to making AI more open and thus even more accessible to developers. For decades, we've contributed to critical AI projects like TensorFlow and JAX. We've co-founded the PyTorch Foundation with Meta. And recently, we announced a new industry consortium, the OpenXLA project. Another important topic customers often ask me about is sustainability. We have brought together the power of sustainability and AI, with AI-driven efficiency tools baked right into the platform. For example, by default, we prompt all developers to deploy their services in low carbon regions across our infrastructure. We use AI to automatically identify idle resources and show you the carbon and money you'll save by turning them down. And we give you granular visibility into your entire emissions profile to confidently report against your targets. Using these tools, customers like Salesforce have reduced their cloud carbon emissions for certain workloads by up to 80%. Stay tuned today to learn how Uber's IT Hero met both their sustainability and cost savings objectives with Google Cloud. Now, over to Hen for more tips on increasing developer velocity. Thanks, Sachin. So we've talked about sustainability and cost saving. Now it's time to talk about developer velocity. I spend a lot of time talking with customers and IT decision makers, and their main challenges center around acquiring talent with the right skills and optimizing for developers' velocity. At Google, we faced similar challenges and recognized one of the best ways to optimize time is to simplify and standardize the way software is created. We were one of the early pioneers of containers as a way to package and deploy software, and we now launch around 4 billion containers every week. While customers often agree with the positive impact containers can have on developer velocity, it's not sufficient for driving innovation. How do we reduce barriers to adopting new technology? How do we proactively think about scalability, observability, and security? And finally, how can we make decisions today that will allow us to evolve in the future? Questions like these have been the guiding principle behind our work and are key to meeting our goal of making container tools extremely powerful, yet simple to use. There are three capabilities that make Google Cloud the best place to run containerized workloads a great developer experience, most automated Kubernetes platform, and portability of workloads. When it comes to great developer experience, we specifically focused on accelerating developer productivity. With Cloud Run, lack of container or in-house expertise should never hold you back from quickly and safely deploying and scaling container-based applications. With a single command, developers can build and deploy their code to Cloud Run. We've spent a lot of time on getting this experience right, and we are very proud of the fact that we were recently independently rated as having the best developer experience among our peers. Customers like Carefor have benefited directly because of this developer experience. By moving a traditional on-prem server environment into a fully managed container environment, 
Carefor saw a four times faster startup time of their batch jobs. Next, GK. Since our launch in 2014, Google remains the largest contributor to the Kubernetes open source project. But we've also been continually improving our managed Kubernetes service. GKE is the most automated Kubernetes platform in the market. Thanks to these automations, our customers have been able to solve day two and day three problems at scale in standardized ways. And with innovation like GKE Autopilot, we've been adding more and more automation. With Autopilot, Google manages your cluster configuration, scaling and security setting for you, saving you a lot of time and effort. Thanks to this automation, customers like BrainCorp have migrated from Amazon EKS to GKE and improved their velocity significantly. We know this is the beginning of your digital journey. We anticipate that your requirements will evolve. And rather than decide on a single platform, with Google Cloud, you can use GKE, Cloud Run, or both. We allow you to make these transitions without retooling or re-architecting, supporting the flexibility teams need to drive innovation. We have covered how a great developer experience, most automated Kubernetes platform, along with portability, make Google Cloud the leading platform for running your containerized workloads. And most importantly, you can be sure that a steep learning curve does not hold you back from leveraging the various benefits modern technologies can offer. In the breakout sessions today, you'll hear from customers like Carefor and Telus. They will reveal how they turbocharge their team's deployment speed with containers, along with the right tools, processes, and cultural practices. Next, Sachin will take us through security and sovereignty. Take it away, Sachin. Thanks, Han. So today, Han and I have covered AI, sustainability, and developer velocity. Everything we have to discuss today relies upon robust security that you can trust across the cloud, across the enterprise, on any type of device, and at any scale. 31% of global enterprise cloud decision makers ranked cybersecurity as a top investment priority for their organization in 2023. But how and where do you invest when your resources are limited? Google keeps more people and organizations safe online than anyone else in the world. Billions of users and millions of websites globally. At Google Cloud, we are championing a future of invisible security where security is engineered into our platforms, operations are simplified, and the need for scarce security talent is reduced. You can easily deploy a wide range of tools depending on your own risk profile, allowing you to prevent, detect, and respond to threats faster. Security companies like Broadcom use ML-based Cloud Armor adaptive protection to dynamically defend their web applications against evolving threats. Proposed security rules can be automatically deployed or previewed allowing security team members to see the effects of a rule in cloud monitoring without having to enforce it first. Customers like L'Oreal and Commerce Bank are using our software delivery shield tooling like cloud workstations to secure their development environments. And Iron Mountain is using assured workloads to strengthen their security and compliance posture with controls configured by default, which reduce the security risk due to misconfiguration and help achieve multinational compliance faster and easier. But you don't have to be a Google Cloud user to take advantage of the power of Google security. Solutions like Chronicle for security operations and Mandiant's frontline threat intelligence work wherever you operate, in our cloud, on-premises, and across other clouds. To meet your unique requirements for control, transparency, and sovereignty, whether driven by government policy, industry regulation, or geopolitical considerations, Google offers a portfolio of digital sovereignty solutions across three distinct pillars. Data sovereignty, operational sovereignty, and software sovereignty. Last month, we made Google Distributed Cloud Hosted generally available for workloads with the most stringent requirements, including classified, restricted, and top secret data. GDC Hosted is air-gapped and does not require connectivity to Google Cloud or the public internet at any time to manage the infrastructure. In Europe, Proximus recently selected GDC Hosted in a multi-year agreement to deliver sovereign cloud services for governments, regulated enterprises, and international organizations in Belgium and Luxembourg. In the United States, the Department of Defense recently selected Google Cloud as an approved vendor in the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability contract vehicle. Later today, you will be able to hear from our partner T-Systems, 
one of the largest European IT service companies on how we're co-innovating to bring new sovereign cloud solutions to market. Back to you, Sally. Thank you, Sahana, Sachin, and Hen for those incredible insights. Next up, you'll get strategies and playbooks on optimizing for the major objectives and pain points facing IT leaders today, including AI innovation, skills building, shrinking budgets, developer velocity, security, sovereignty, and sustainability. Your perfect plan to optimize for big topics like these might feel years away, but the important thing is you're making progress by being here today. These sessions cover practical steps you can take today to get started towards your goals. Remember, perfect is the enemy of good. The key is to simply get started, and Google Cloud is here to help you on that journey. Now it's time to hear directly from IT leaders at our customers and partners who are optimizing for business outcomes with Google Cloud and already reaching IT hero status. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the rest of the summit. everyone, thank you for joining today for the IT Hero Summit and welcome to our Optimize for AI Innovation session, where we'll be diving into AI infrastructure. My name is Mikhail, an outbound product manager for Vertex AI. Today, I'm excited to have two guests, Saurav and Barak with me. Saurav is the ML infrastructure lead for the Prisma SASE product line of Palo Alto Networks, an early partner and user of Vertex AI. He's going to discuss scalable ML infrastructure with Vertex AI. Barak is the CTO of AI21 Labs, a generative AI company leveraging large language models to reimagine the ways human and humans read and write. He'll touch on AI infrastructure on Google Cloud that helps power their research lab and product. Today, we'll start with a quick intro followed by our two guest speakers and close out with some resources for you to learn more about AI infrastructure on Google Cloud. And before we jump in into our user stories, I want to touch on AI infrastructure on Google Cloud across three pillars. First, scalable, high-performance AI starts with a strong foundation. On Google Cloud, we support diverse ML workloads with varying hardware needs, with support across CPUs, GPUs, and Google's own TPUs. Second, managed infrastructure helps practitioners focus on innovating and deploying ML models into production instead of managing clusters and nodes. And this is handled with Vertex AI, a fully managed data science and ML ops platform. And finally, third, with Google Cloud, we want to allow teams to easily access state-of-the-art AI with optimized infrastructure and software out of the box. This includes models and solutions originating from Google Research, DeepMind, as well as partners. So now I'm going to hand it over to Saurav to talk about how Palo Alto Network scales innovation. To you, Saurav. Thanks, Mikhail, for the introduction. I work for Palo Alto Networks, and Palo Alto Networks is a leading cybersecurity company. Prisma SASE, or Secure Access Service Edge, is a fully managed, highly available multi-cloud and security service solution. As a consequence, we have millions of connected users and a very large number of network elements generating a very high volume of network and application telemetry that we need to consume and ensure that our network is performing as expected and the users using the applications on this network are having a good experience. As a result, we built an AI-driven autonomous digital experience management solution where we are using natively integrated AI ops 
to automate complex IT operations, both for our customers and ourselves. To build an AI-driven autonomous digital experience management solution, from an AI infrastructure side, we needed to address four challenges. We needed an infrastructure to run large number of large time series models across the globe. We also wanted to leverage an infrastructure that needs minimal engineering resources while we focus on the data that we generate and building ML algorithms to make sense of that data. Talking of data, network data drifts often, which means for many of our use cases, we need to train models efficiently, at least at a daily regular cadence. Model inference needs to scale seamlessly based on traffic and the use case patterns in a cost-optimized fashion. To address these challenges, we decided to go with Vertex AI. This is a high-level, multi-region, multi-project ML infrastructure that we run today in Palo Alto Networks. As you can see in the diagram, we use BQ as our feature store, powered by Dataflow pipelines that consume our telemetry, transforms, and extract features to put into our BQ datasets at a very large scale. That data then gets fed to our model training pipelines to build large deep neural network time series models across the globe. The models when built gets deployed to the prediction engine in the Vertex AI infrastructure to do both online prediction as well as batch inference. To make sure that everything is running smoothly across the globe, we built an ML infrastructure observability dashboard that can observe all our deployments and services that are running across the globe, across different regions and projects seamlessly from a single place. Now, coming to the core of what Vertex AI provides us in terms of infrastructure, we need to optimize for cost and performance at scale without dedicated infra teams. For that, what we built, we have an orchestration infrastructure that can run multiple mini batches of parallel training jobs. Now, to make that happen efficiently, we partnered with the Vertex AI team who optimized the training cluster cold start time and the pod initialization time. And when this multiple mini batches of training jobs run, the cluster is kept hot, so we again save on time and cost both. The model metadata APIs and the model registry gives us the ability to track all of our training jobs at large scale across all our deployments. And the custom containers gives us the flexibility to build our custom models and train, iterate, learn, and get better every day. Scaling up inference at an optimized cost is another big challenge for us. We depend on Vertex AI to auto-scale our inference engines. Currently, our prediction and anomaly detection algorithms often use ensemble mode during inference. It currently runs in a cascade mode and uses a metric-driven algorithm, and the responses are returned from the appropriate model based on the metric results. For the use cases where we need to reduce our latency, the ability to use the NVIDIA Triton inference engine and its seamless integration with Vertex is a great option for us to go quickly adopt that route. The goal is really to have an infrastructure that gives us the ability to bring models to production faster and maintain them cleanly over time. Not having to maintain our own Kubernetes clusters to run training pipelines or inference engines is a big plus to us. Having the ability to use centralized alerts by Google monitoring is also a big operational boost to our SRE teams and the developers alike. For better observability, we use BQ and Looker Studio for collecting training and inference metrics and visibility. Training and inference jobs, a bit time series metrics that are consumed in BQ and expressed via Looker Studio dashboards for SRE and developers to understand the model behavior in production. Finally, 
We want to focus on the data and the algorithm and leverage Vertex and GCP to enable to run the infrastructure with minimum engineering overhead. And the experience so far has been great. I want to conclude with this quote, where someone said that running models without proper observability is like driving a non-self-driving car with your eyes closed. Don't do it. And with that, I hand it back to you, Mikhail. Thank you so much, Saurabh. Really appreciate you sharing your journey and those great insights. So uh, in the intro, I touched on the three ways teams can take advantage of AI infrastructure on Google Cloud. And before I hand it to our second speaker, Barack, I wanted to highlight some of our recent and newer offerings across our portfolio. And many of these offerings really touch on this new AI era we're in. Uh, today, developers and teams are really starting to understand the magic that can happen when applying AI to your unstructured data and allowing users to interact with not just tabular data, but language and vision. More teams are adopting deep learning frameworks, leveraging larger and larger models, and really thinking about ways to complement predictive AI capabilities with generative AI capabilities. And all this requires, again, purpose-built AI infrastructure and the tools and softwares to match. So starting on the left side with the, uh, with the hardware, we continue to invest heavily in our AI accelerator offering. This starts with our advancements with Google's TPU pods that now support PyTorch, JAX, and TensorFlow, and also our continued partnership with NVIDIA uh, with our recent launch of the NVIDIA L4 GPU, which is ideal for generative AI models optimized for cost and performance. In the middle with Vertex AI, we continue to, to support large scale distributed training, low latency serving, and we wanted to highlight our recently launched improved PyTorch serving inference engine. And finally, on the last pillar, we continue to make available many of the art, state of the art technologies originating within Google to external enterprises across the world. This includes leading edge translation, speech and language a APIs, low code auto ML services, and we were excited recently to launch new generative AI capabilities on Vertex AI across text, chat, code, and image capabilities. Which brings me to our next speaker. We are also excited to support the next generation of AI partners and customers building new capabilities so now I'm going to hand it off to Barack from AI21 Labs. Barack, to you. Thanks, Mikhail. My name is Barack Lenz. I'm the CTO of AI21 Labs. We at AI21 Labs are revolutionizing the way people read and write. One of our main challenges was finding an AI free infrastructure that will provide flexibility and the use of a variety of GPUs. Our solution? the use of Google Cloud GPUs to build and serve language models with up to 178 billion parameters. These models power a text generation and comprehension features in thousands of live applications. We leverage a variety of GPUs available to us at a cost-effective way to meet the demands of different audiences as these demands change throughout the day, making sure we're able to serve our customers efficiently while also spending as little money as possible. I hope this was insightful. Back to you, Mikhail. Thank you so much for sharing that, Barack. So now to conclude, I wanted to summarize that to drive the most value and in innovation from AI, we really do believe that AI infrastructure needs to be core to your AI strategy. We hope a lot of these resources will be helpful for you as you learn more about AI infrastructure on Google Cloud. Uh, I want to conclude this by thanking Saurabh and Barak, our guest speakers, uh, and hope all of you enjoy the rest of the sessions at the IT Hero Summit. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us at the ID Hero Summit. I hope you are all enjoying the session so far. If this is your first, 
Dal, welcome. In this session, we will talk about something that is top of mind for everyone. Optimizing for shrinking budgets. Doing more with less. All right, let's get started. We'll spend most of our time talking to our IT hero, Alexander, and learn about how ADT achieved efficiency in the cloud. Next up, we will talk about how other customers approach cloud cost optimization. And finally, close out the session with the IT Heroes playbook that you will all have access to. My name is Pathik, and I lead cloud cost optimization in our Cloud FinOps practice. With me joining here is our IT hero, Alexander, IT Director of Cloud Services for ADT Security. Alexander, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and ADT Security? Hi, Patrick. Yeah, my name is Alexander Bingham. I'm the IT Director for Cloud Services. And actually, this month, I'll be celebrating my 10th year at ADT. I'm currently responsible for the governance and the policies and enabling the ADT community to consume cloud services across um, ADT. Happy 10th anniversary, Alexander. Thanks. Given the microeconomic climate, cloud cost optimization is top of mind for IT leaders. I'm curious to learn your take and what it means for you and ADT. Yeah, it's very germane to our IT transformation that we're trying to go through. Uh, today, we're largely on-premise data centers, and we've been moving into the cloud over the last couple of years. And doing that uh, presents unique challenges, uh, many of them such as financial responsible ways to migrate to the cloud. Um, and so being so that we've done that, we've uh, identified ways that we can reduce our impact as well as ensure that our applications that we're not transforming can also move to the cloud in a financial responsible way and make that easier um, by reducing change to the end users and the support staff that manages those applications. That is great to know. Can you please share some of the examples of ADT's journey and early success as you migrate onto Google Cloud? Yeah, when we first started moving to Google Cloud, we were focused heavily on our data warehouse. We were running a data warehouse on-prem that required our staff to schedule time to run their reports. Uh, it seems like we never had enough computing power to actually do so. And so when we first began looking at Google Cloud, we looked at BigQuery. And we saw our reports, for example, people can run their reporting, pull their data at any time that they want, and it's taking you know, 30 times faster than it did on-prem. So things that were taking hours before were taking seconds within Google. Um, Along the way, we also decided that we want to start leveraging GCVE for DR from on-prem environments. So we built some VMware environments within Google using GCVE and targeted those with tools like SRM and HCX from VMware. And that gave us an ability to fail our data centers into Google Cloud and not have to make large capital investments for capacity on-prem that we weren't consuming anymore. And then because of that, that reduced significantly our costs of what we needed to establish a DR. And then finally, we've been migrating on-prem data centers and sometimes closing entire data centers. We did one recently where we closed an entire data center within 90 days, and largely because we used GCVE to migrate everything from our legacy data center into cloud. Those are some impressive results. Kudos to you and your team for achieving this. Can you, can you please tell us which other Google Cloud products have you leveraged and how did it impact ADT's transformation? So there's a lot of different things that we're using within Google Cloud, from cloud functions to cloud run, uh, using um, not only BigQuery, but Bigtable and some of the databases, Cloud SQL capabilities. Um, however, one of the challenges with doing so is that requires a level of transformation. And that transformation can take a considerable amount of time and investment, not just in the cost of doing the transform, but the, the time that it takes and the labor that it takes. Um, so as we've been migrating applications into Google Cloud, we've also been migrating things from on-prem because that's become the fastest way using GCVE for us to get our applications. While many of them are very complex and they have several components to them, if we're only transforming one component, but we need to keep everything kind of together, we're able to move those applications because we're more than 97% virtualized on-prem using VMware. So moving from VMware on-prem to VMware in the cloud uh, makes that a very simple thing so that we can transform the components that drive more business value for us. 
I see you mentioned GCVE or Google Cloud VMware engine multiple times. I have to ask you now this. What is it that you love about its technical architecture? So in the past, for us to stand up VMware environments or capacity on-prem, you've got to order hardware, then you've got to configure the hardware. And even using appliance approaches, that can take a considerable amount of time. You're still looking at 45 to 90 days at some points to get that stuff completed. Where what we found with VMware using TCVE is just by plugging in the simple information like the IP addressing, the configuration we're after, we're able to build an entire environment in less than an hour. So that means I can deliver capacity when it's really needed without telling my business that they have to wait for that capacity. And that alone has given us an agility that we just did not have previously. So I love how you mentioned that story about doing it at scale. I'm curious, you mentioned a lot of technical uh, bits and pieces in there. Um, were there any cultural resistance in the organization uh, when you were doing this massive, you know, 95, 97% of the lift from, from on-prem to Google Cloud? Yeah. I mean, we're a 150-year-old business. So transforming, while we have transformed over the past, there's a lot of challenges with change. All IT people are, have experienced some resistance to change. And especially when you move from, you know, people that traditionally have managed the infrastructure services from on-prem, and now you're moving that into a cloud, the ability for us to leverage things like GCBE have reduced a lot of the challenges around that change because it's effectively the same thing. They're managing VMware either on-prem or in the cloud. And, and when they realize that it pretty much functions exactly the same, a lot of that resistance disappears. I think the biggest challenge for us was around probably the financial governance. We're on-prem, typically most companies approach things from a capitalization perspective, whereas we move into cloud, that really shifts or alters the way you manage the cost of moving into cloud. And so by driving more of the financial governance and developing methods to do showback and chargeback against the business by using tagging within VMware or in within Google, we've been able to change um, that conversation uh, with the finance team and with our business owners around account and drive a little more accountability around their consumption. That is incredible. I love how you have used the cloud financial operations, also known as cloud FinOps framework, to dynamically just moving from on-prem to cloud and have seen such impressive results. Right. Lastly, let me, let me ask you this, Alexander. What recommendation would you share with your fellow IT leaders who are listening to us right now? Yeah, I would say do not lose sight of the business value that you're trying to bring to the company. Um, you can optimize pretty much uh, in a number of different ways, but also don't be penny wise and pound foolish when you're doing it. You're making an investment in the future of your company. Um, I would say while we in the past have focused on engineering time and effort to build our infrastructure, now we're actually spending a lot more time driving the value to our business, um, delivering infrastructure in, in a speed with which we haven't been able to do before, um, really making that part of the operational experience, setting it to the side. The most significant thing I would say that I would take away from all of this is make sure you're partnering with all the stakeholders in your company. And not this isn't just an IT transformation, but it's also for finance as well. You're going to bring value to the company when they can understand what the cost of doing business is and what the real true costs of hosting environments or workloads within the cloud are by partnering with them to develop kind of that FinOps practice of showing them um, how much the costs are for operating your applications that you're managing in the cloud. I love how you have pulled together the people, process, culture, and technology all together in terms of getting the transformation. This is the true transformation story. Thank you for telling us that. It doesn't happen overnight, and I'm glad that you were able to share the story with our customers. Um, thank you, Alexander. Just like uh, Alexander shared, we have a whole spectrum of cost optimization strategies out there. What you see here on the screen are the various ways ADT and other customers are using to lower their costs in cloud. Depending upon the use case, some might provide you high value with minimal or reasonable effort. And to echo what Alexander just mentioned, don't be 
you know, pound foolish uh, and penny wise. No matter where you are in your cloud journey, we have dedicated team as part of the professional services cloud FinOps practice to help our customers drive cloud financial accountability, accelerating the value for your engineering time, effort, and then creating sustainable business outcomes by cross-functionally working with IT finance partnership, procurement, business, and more in a most effective way through your crawl, walk, and run journey. To wrap up our call, I want to highlight six different strategies that our customers are embracing in this macroeconomic climate of shrinking budgets. Starting with one, what Alexander rightly mentioned, establishing that operational framework and a cost-conscious culture by embracing and adopting cloud FinOps. Two, driving cloud cost optimization and efficiencies by incorporating Google Cloud best practices for your applications that are being migrated or are already migrated in Google Cloud. May it be for compute, storage, networking, databases, and more. If you are actively migrating, accelerate your VMware, SAP, Windows, Oracle, and other workloads efficiently by leveraging easy-to-use Google Cloud technologies. Many customers, just like ADT, have lowered their total cost of ownership by modernizing their applications using Anthos or serverless technologies like Cloud Run and Cloud Operations Suite. Our customers unlock their data by using BigQuery, Looker, and Vertex AI to intersect with machine learning and improve the decision-making process from days to seconds. And finally, we see customers are creating new revenue streams and ecosystems from their API products using Apigee. I hope this was helpful for all of the ID leaders who are watching this session right now. Thank you, Alexander, for sharing the story. And thank you all for joining. Check out the other sessions in the ID Hero Summit and have a great day. Welcome to the Google Cloud IT Hero Summit. My name is Jeremy Krennic. I'm a developer relations manager at NVIDIA, and I'm here to talk with you about generative AI. Generative AI has really changed the landscape and has really changed the way that we think about AI in general. So new capabilities like GPT-4 with text generation, our own Edify model and image generation, uh, code generation, changing the way that the developers are, are working with code, uh, translation changing the, the context that we can put into the translations that we're driving, and life science with our own BioNemo model, helping organizations uh, to be able to uh, create new drugs that are going to help therapies in the future. We've seen thousands of companies that are enter entering the generative AI space, and we've been able to help these organizations in order to realize their vision for what they're trying to create with generative AI. The whole landscape for generative AI has changed, and fundamental to that has been the huge amount of data that's being fed into these models. Uh, ultimately, the complexity of these models with the parameters that they're driving and the huge amount of content has led to a whole new type of model that we call foundation models. And these foundation models add huge flexibility in what they're capable of doing. So they can drive whole new capabilities, they can uh, enable new tasks, and ultimately they can be tuned to specific applications. And this has significantly changed the way that we perceive these technologies but it's also required huge compute in order to be able to, to create this new whole level of complexity of models. There's a lot of challenges in training and inferencing these models. Uh, let's talk about a couple of them. So first of all, as I mentioned, huge amounts of data need to be fed in in order to create the great flexibility of these models. Uh, this is not without controversy. Uh, the sourcing of this data is really important in how we drive these capabilities and making sure that 
that the appropriate rights have been gained uh, in, in using this content. Uh, it, it requires huge compute in order to drive these models. Often tens of millions of dollars are being spent in order to train these models, to rent that infrastructure in the cloud, and uh, to be able to continue to experiment and drive the future of these models. Uh, deep technical expertise is required in training and even managing the infrastructure in order to be able to drive these models. And finally, we can't just train a model once. We've got to continue to experiment with novel approaches to driving those desired results. We see a huge trend around first being able to expand the flexibility of these models and then being able to constrain those back to, to get closer more quickly to what we're looking for, both in terms of the accuracy of what we're generating, uh, as well as being able to adhere to particular standards. We're really happy to be partnering with Google on an end-to-end -end stack for generative AI workloads. So we've announced the L4 Tensor Core GPU within Google Cloud. This provides incredible efficiency in scale in AI workloads, uh, being able to deal very efficiently with video and generative AI in order to provide our partner scale, partners like Wombo and Descript. Also really critical to the whole process of dealing with generative AI is the data and being able to utilize Rapids and Spark and Google Cloud Dataproc uh, provides a, a great uh, efficiency in the training process, being able to efficiently take in that data for the purposes of training. Also really uh, an important piece of our partnership with Google Cloud is an integration with Vertex AI to accelerate the AI workloads for building, training, and customizing generative AI apps. This on top of NVIDIA GPUs becomes a critical piece to efficiently driving AI workloads from training through to inference. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, NVIDIA AI Enterprise. Uh, so this is really a full stack of AI capabilities and software that really enables extraction of the full power of our hardware. Uh, taking advantage of things like TensorRT and Triton are really critical to being able to, to scale and ultimately provide these capabilities on a broad basis. You'll also see capabilities like transcription and others uh, that are all delivered as a part of uh, NVIDIA AI Enterprise and ultimately provides a supported platform so you've got someone to reach out to to, to help uh, as you're building out your AI solution. And then this, of course, all lives on top of, of our hardware uh, that really enables all of this to take place. Uh, so being able to deliver this through uh, Google Cloud Marketplace makes it easier for our, our partners to be able to build the applications uh, that they, they're looking to deliver to their users. So we've just announced some services as well recently. Uh, so in partnering with Google Cloud, uh, we've announced EGX Cloud. Uh, this provides the, the full power of uh, NVIDIA hardware implemented in the fastest possible implementation, uh, taking advantage of both our GPUs and our interconnects uh, to be able to provide the maximum performance in training. Uh, DGX Cloud allows you to essentially have a supercomputer through a browser. Uh, so also we announced uh, NVIDIA AI Foundations. Uh, so this, this takes some really advanced capabilities like large language models, uh, media generation, and BioNemo, which provides drug discovery and uh, packages these up, these up in a way that is very easy to access through an API. All of this lives on top of uh, NVIDIA DGX Cloud, which is available through Google Cloud later this year. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, NVIDIA DGX Cloud. So previously, in order to have these capabilities for training and inference, you'd have to go and collect a variety of different software. Uh, you'd have to deal with variable cost. Uh, you'd have to really roll your own stack, uh, taking advantage of different tools and ultimately dealing with the, the compatibility of those in order to train these workloads and in inference. With DGX Cloud, it pulls together the AI enterprise platform uh, on top of the, the fastest hardware for training and in inference and, uh, and provides this to you in an easy to access and a predictable uh, package. Uh, also really critical to this is the AI experts within NVIDIA who you can engage in order to help you to make sure that you're extracting the most power out of the platform. So I'd like to talk about uh, a couple of our partners and the way that they've been using artificial intelligence in order to drive an entirely different experience. The first of those is Descript. So Descript has really changed the way that we look at editing audio and video content. Uh, they've, they've created a whole new interface to interacting with this content, where instead of thinking about frames and thinking about waveforms and, and editing content, uh, now we're doing it just as we would edit a document. Uh, so all of the content uh, becomes text, 
and we can decide what portions we want in, what portions we want out. And uh, we can even insert new portions uh, in our own voices uh, through the, the Descript tool. So let's take a quick look at, at Descript. So this is really define, redefine the way that we look at, at uh, our content generation pipeline. Uh, so you know, with Descript, you can, you can change the essence of the content simply by editing the document. If you want to take out a section or add a new section in, it's really as, as easy as editing the text itself. Now let's talk about another partner named Ryder. So Ryder has really become a key uh, solution in the area of enterprise content generation. Uh, Ryder is really focused on, on streamlining the process and, and making the process very efficient to generate uh, enterprise content. Uh, so with their tools, you can, you can create marketing campaigns, you can, you can create a variety of different textual content. And ultimately, all of this uh, lives on top of NVIDIA GPUs, on top of in A100s and, and A2s within Google Cloud. Uh, let's take a quick look at what, what Ryder provides. Generating five times more high quality content, spending 70% less time editing, doubling search traffic in a month. These are just some of the things companies are doing with Writer's AI writing platform. How do they do it? Writer creates an AI model based off your best performing content and brand standards. So Writer's suggestions always sound like you at your best. Then you use Writer to help generate ideas and write drafts, giving you the perfect blend of speed, control, and inspiration. Writer can also help you finish what you've already started and generate exactly what you need for repurposing and distribution, whether that's social content or turning live event transcripts into blog posts. Writer can even read the web for you and generate new content from there. But Writer isn't just AI content generation. It's also an always on editorial and brand voice assistant that helps create consistency at every customer touch point. So go ahead, fill up your content calendar, break through your content bottlenecks, and do it all knowing exactly where your content came from. You, that's right. So in summary, uh, this is really the beginning of the journey of generative AI. We're happy to be partnering with Google Cloud, uh, looking at recent announcements around uh, L4 GPUs uh, available in Google Cloud. Uh, at the whole NVIDIA AI enterprise software stack with TensorRT and Triton uh, being able to provide things like batching of, of uh, processing of content, a key element in providing the ability to scale available through Google Cloud Marketplace. And finally, all of the NVIDIA AI solutions in Google Cloud from Vertex to, to Cloud Dataflow, uh, you know, all available through our partnership with Google Cloud. Uh, I hope this session has been helpful to you and, uh, and thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the Google Cloud IT Hero Summit. Welcome to this session. We're going to have some fun talking about developer velocity today. We have uh, two great speakers. I'll let them introduce themselves real quick before we jump in. Alessandra, tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Alessandra from Italy. I'm the chief digital officer here in uh, Carrefour Italia, head of uh, e-commerce marketing data, and my first love and passion, IT and digital transformation. Awesome. Justin, please introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Justin Watts. I work at TELUS as a director of engineering focused on developer productivity platforms. You are the right people to have in this conversation. So let's start off and let's set a little context first. Can you tell us a little bit, Alessandra, first about a bit of the shape of your developer org? Is it 
outsourced or do you have folks in-house? Is it a very senior team, a very junior team, maybe in the middle? Are they all physically co-located or are they spread all over the place? Can you set us a little context, please? Well, in the last three years, the dev team changed a lot. We have the ambition to become a digital retail company. That means digital at the center of the business strategy. This is why digital and the dev team have become key for our transformation. It's not a big one, but is now one third of our tech department. This is the internal part. And we also leverage an external team with different suppliers. And thanks to that, we have the I can say right mix of seniority skills uh, and also tech and retail experience. I was a developer many, many years ago, and now I'm lucky enough to lead an amazing dev team. That's excellent. Justin, tell us a little bit about your team. Dallas is interesting. Uh, it has a remote first culture from before the pandemic, and we've actually got dev teams spread out across Canada in a mix of internal and external including a very large uh, IT division, a dedicated digital e-commerce division, uh, core networking. And because TELUS works in so many different areas from health, telecommunications, to agriculture, uh, we're constantly working with new technologies, some that date back 20, 30 years, some on the bleeding edge. So it's really interesting looking at how to make tooling and opportunities that work across the board, but don't sub-optimize. So let's leave this with you first, Justin. We define developer velocity for me. We all talk about different things. How do you think about what that means? How do you measure it? Give me a, give me an answer for that, please. It's interesting because when I think about velocity, um, I always like to think of it as having multiple dimensions. And part of velocity that is really important for us is joy and focus and flow. Those three things um, allow us to deliver impact. So I don't necessarily think of velocity as the amount of things that you're delivering, but the amount of impact you're able to deliver, uh, maximizing the developer's experience along the way. How do you measure that? For us, we definitely have a look at Dora metrics in a way that we try not to use them as a target, but as a measure of a capability. We never want there to be an impediment in the way of the developer. So largely when we look at developer velocity, it's how do we remove blockers? How do we remove impediments such that they're able to operate in the way they want to, that makes them feel comfortable uh, to deliver the value they're looking to deliver? So for us, it's definitely about looking at what's in the way, not what can we add. Hmm. Alessandra, how do you think about developer velocity? What is it to you? How do you measure it? For us, uh, dev uh, velocity is our capacity to answer the customers and the business needs, the rhythm and the frequency of innovation, creating business value. We measure it uh, with different key metrics. The first one, maybe the obvious one, is the time to market. Uh, well, I mean, the, the time between the request from the business and the deployment of the solution and if I look back on 2019, when the digital transformation started, and I compare Kafu today, I can tell you that we increased 10 times, well, from hundreds of releases per year up to thousands. And now we can measure our projects in weeks rather than months. But we use also other metrics like defect rate that has been drastically reduced. Also, the deployment time from hours to minutes and also very important, the customer satisfaction. We measure the net promoter score and we increased by 20 points in the last two years. Really amazing. That is amazing. Alessandro, do developers care about that customer sat score, net promoter score? Is that something they're invested in or do their managers care? So how, how low does that get? Does a developer wake up thinking about how am I making the developer or the customer more satisfied? It's across all the company. We have this culture across all the department, all levels. So we all care about the net promoter score, listening the the customer's needs, uh, their suggestions in different ways, but it's part of our daily job. Yeah, I love that. Those are all, all impactful. Now, of course, a lot of times when people speak at event, events like this, everything's great. Like we're a success story, but there's challenges. Clearly not everything is perfect. So Alessandro, when you think of the some of the challenges you face trying to increase that developer productivity and any of the strategies you might employ to, to kind of fix it, kind of explain a little bit what gets in the way. What are the things that slow you down? 
two main challenges that slow down our velocity. The first one is the fact that we still have quite a lot of very old application legacy system across the company that slow down when you have to integrate very old solution with the modern world. And another, and, and another challenge is more related to culture, change management processes. The dev team, when starting a new, uh, developing a new solution, has to coordinate a lot of different working groups, stakeholders, suppliers, and it is hard to onboard on our agile methodology, different people in different departments. So uh, we, we, we set up a, a, a strategy, I would say some principles. The first one is to work on a cloud first approach. And here the partnership with Google um, had uh, an important role. And the second principle is to internalize the governance and the knowledge of the transformation. The third one is to adopt a DevOps methodology, or, or um, as we prefer to say, a DevOps mindset that brings uh, standardization, automation, and ultimately also quality and security. The fourth one is having an API-based architecture. I mean, API microservices that have to be reused by rule to increase the velocity of the development. And uh, the last one is starting with a business-driven digital transformation, not tech for tech at all, but working with the business to create value and to get back the resources that we need to continue our transformation. Hmm. Yeah, that's terrific. Justin, how do you think about some of the challenges you've either experienced yourself or your team experiences and what gets in the way of being a productive developer and what kind of strategies do you think about to try to fix some of that? Yeah, Talos is interesting and it's got a dimension of breadth and depth. We develop products across agriculture, health, telecommunications, and the opportunity of technologies that can be shared is high, but also that have very specific business needs is high. And when I think about depth, I think about how long TELUS has been around and thus what it's built. Kelsey Hightower was talking with us recently and we decided to throw away the term legacy and, and use the word dynasty. And the reason why is we always think like, let's go hire the best and we'll go build something great. And he said to us like, what happened to the last round of best you hired, right? What's going on with them? And so when we think about this digital divide of what made us great, that last great product and where we wanna to get to, how do we go on that journey together? And so when we think of developer velocity, it's oftentimes really locked into the cloud, the new tooling, the new folks that we're bringing in, the new, the new, the new. And I really think about how we get slowed down or, or miss out on a lot of value by not bringing actually uh, the old or the things that made us great originally. And so trying to reduce that digital divide between the groups and between the teams, trying to find ways to really make sure that we're bringing along our oldest products and modernizing them, deprecating them, and allowing the team that we have already to enjoy, and utilize, and leverage these great technologies we're bringing in is how we stop that um, lack of really developer velocity across the company um, and make it more impactful. And that's really, really tough on an enterprise scale of TELUS um, and bringing together teams from so many different departments across the country and different working styles. That's fair. Let me leave this with you. I'll ask one more question of each of you. You both mentioned culture, which I, I think we both know is sometimes the hard part. Sometimes the tech is the hard part. Is there some? Is there a, either emerging technology to you or emerging technology to the industry that you do see actually helping move you forward? Do you look at something and say, hey, we have to work on our people? But sometimes it is a technology shift that actually can pull the culture forward or kind of enforce a change. So is there any technology that's helping you move forward a little faster with dev productivity? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, it's interesting what's old is new again, but specifically software catalogs and the rise of, once again, bringing that information to the forefront and organizing complex information. Uh, for us, um, we've re been really excited about uh, the open source project Backstage and how that lets us actually make the discovery of information more possible. We have an unbelievable number of heterogeneous systems. And so having a 
homogenous interface to be able to interact with them and grok them. So not necessarily where information is stored, but where it's accessed, where it's indexed, um, has gone a long way with that human change management and anything from just sparks of, of innovation. So seeing something you might not have come across because it's in a team 20 teams away or being able to kind of have a hunch search a term and then dig in through all of those connected bits of metadata. Um, we found that to be a really interesting space. It's nascent, it's emergent, uh, and we're really excited about it uh, specifically, uh, you know, these developer productivity portals. Hmm. Alessandra, any technology that's kind of you have your eye on or that you're using right now? Yes, cloud computing tech like containers and the serverless services are having the most significant impact because they permit us to create smaller and simpler application, easier to maintain and to evolve. And this is an important part. But we also see a huge potential coming from AI and machine learning. And in particular, in the testing part of the process of the life cycle, mm -hmm. helping our developers in, in the very first stage of, uh, of the process and for sure, we really want to introduce a test-driven dev approach. And here, I'm sure machine learning can, can play an important role. It should. And I think both of you point out the, the importance that there's an investment here. This is not just going to be teams figuring out how to go faster, that you're going to invest in technology, people, skills, hiring, training. So it's an exciting time. I know a few things we've thought about as well on this overall developer velocity journey. And you've pointed them out as, you know, as you think of CSAT scores or NPS, as you think of real goals people stick to and enabling automation, building this learning culture. We just talked about some of the resources and tools. Don't starve your teams. You probably need to give them the things they need to be successful here. And not just going on speed, but quality. It's customer satisfaction and constantly measuring and improving. So we've seen lots of things in this area. Thank you both for a really uh, insightful, short conversation, some great tidbits there. I appreciate you taking some time and thank you all for listening to this. Hope you picked up some good insight there. Until next time. and welcome to the IT Heroes Summit and our session on optimizing for sustainability. I'm Jen Bennett, a senior director in the office of the CTO, and I lead our technology strategy for sustainability. I'm delighted to be joined today by Michael Sadakovich, staff security engineer at Uber. Today, we're going to talk about best practices for prioritizing sustainability in your IT strategy. Much like you might consider performance or cost, um, or security, we really want you to think about sustainability, and we're going to tell you why. Um, we're going to spend most of the time today hearing from Michael on Uber's optimization journey, and then we'll close with a few Google Cloud best practices. At Google Cloud, we're working to reduce the barriers for, that you might face in developing sustainable practices. We understand that building sustainable applications and infrastructure isn't always easy. We recently conducted a survey of, the, of executives about sustainability priorities and the momentum they're facing. It's clear that leaders across the globe and across industries really have a large ambition as it relates to sustainability. Unfortunately, they're having trouble turning that ambition into real projects and action. They're challenged also to bring those cross-functional team members together to really progress the sustainability efforts and they're constantly looking for better tools to measure the impact and to set accurate targets. Today, we're gonna to hear from an IT hero who's helped his organization face these types of challenges and lead Uber towards a more sustainable future. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Michael. Hi everyone, thank you, Jen, for the introduction. 
Uh, so today we're uh, going to walk through Uber's uh, journey towards sustainable engineering. And so we'll start with the uh, vision and roadmap that we uh, created. We'll continue with a collection of best practices. Then we'll talk about some of the services that we've built to allow automation towards sustainable engineering with GCP. And we'll finish with some conclusions and takeaways. So with that, let's get going. Uh, when we talk about vision, we really track progress across four main categories. We start with something manual, such as awareness and training, where we train engineers to evangelize the sustainability practices. Then we continue towards automation with assisted development, uh, where we create services that recommend uh, developers and engineers to improve uh, existing resources and services uh, for sustainability. Uh, then we want to really uh, automate it even further by removing the people from the process such that improvements towards sustainability are made automatically. And finally, we want to provision services in a sustainable by default uh, configuration from the get-go. Uh, so when we talk about awareness and training, uh, we have identified a set of principles that we're going to continue uh, talking to uh, about now. Uh, so, uh, first principle is uh, understanding the impact when it comes to uh, energy usage and sustainability uh, optimizations and carbon emissions, we really cannot optimize uh, something that we cannot measure. So, we really want to uh, measure, go to the uh, metrics such as using the uh, Google uh, carbon dashboard, uh, uh, carbon uh, 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 footprint dashboard. Uh, to understand the uh, impact, understand the CO2 emissions and the energy usage of the services that we uh, utilize. Uh, next, after understanding the metrics, we also want to maximize utilization and to optimize the scale, so to not over-provision resources. Uh, for example, not use too large of a VMs uh, when we don't need them. So we need to take a look into the uh, utilization uh, matrix to try and optimize that for scale. Uh, next, we only try to schedule hardware runs when needed. Uh, we want to avoid unnecessary runs. Unnecessary runs, of course, uh, require more energy. And again, that creates sustainability negative impact. Uh, next, we try using managed services when possible. This allows us to really offload and to share responsibility when it comes to sustainability with the provider. So for example, uh, SaaS and serverless offerings uh, are managed services, and uh, they allow us to really only utilize them, only start them whenever uh, they are needed. Next, we try to set upper scaling limits and alerts, and also set up alerts on cost and budgets, if possible, forecasted budgets. And uh, that's, this allows us to understand whether there is a misconfiguration that might cause us to scale up unnecessarily. Uh, and it can also be a result of a potentially a denial of service or an economic denial of service attack. So we want to see when that happens and to alert the people to start take, taking a look into that. Um, next principle is clean up after you're done. So, uh, you know, after, as usual at home, we try to turn the lights off uh, when we leave the room. Uh, so similar uh, principle comes here when we look at uh, resources. Whenever we finished working with the resource we no longer need it, or when we look at a GCP project, for example, that we no longer need, uh, we really want to uh, eliminate that, to delete that VM, to delete that project uh, so that it doesn't consume any more energy. Uh, and so that it doesn't uh, have a negative impact on sustainability and cost as well. Uh, and then next, uh, we want to deploy in sustainable geographies. So uh, geographies or regions uh, uh, vary from one another by the uh, percentile of green energy that they use. Uh, and we want to only identify and use, whenever possible, uh, the, the uh, geographies and regions that are using the most green energy. And we have the uh, Google Awesome tool to allow us to pick the greenest energy whenever possible. Uh, next, we want to refactor monolithic applications into microservices. So again, comes the principle of only use the part uh, that you need uh, at the time that you need it, instead of using just one big machine that consumes uh, energy all the time. Um, 
Next is an interesting uh, principle of improving code efficiency. Uh, so we all know about uh, complexity, time complexity, and space complexity, and we try to improve it as much as possible. But there's also, of course, the uh, uh, sustainability uh, effect of improving code efficiency. Whenever we use less space and whenever our uh, code or our program uh, needs less time to, uh, to run, uh, of course, it requires less uh, energy and uh, there, there's a sustainability improvement. Uh, uh, and then next, deduplicate code and storage and optimize invocation frequency. We don't necessarily need to store everything for uh, forever. When we look at uh, Google's cloud storage, for example, we can use versioning and we can delete uh, older versions when they're no longer needed. Uh, next, we want to consider energy efficiency when selecting a programming language. So programming languages vary a lot when it comes to their energy usage. So if you have an opportunity to use several programming languages, you might want to take a look into which one is more sustainable. Um, and then next, anticipate and adopt new efficient hardware and software offerings. Uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Uh, new hardware and software offerings tend to be more energy efficient and, uh, of course, contribute less to uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, take a look into the new uh, VMs uh, that you can utilize for uh, improving your uh, energy usage and sustainability metrics. And then finally, utilize carbon-free and carbon-neutral providers. So whenever you're choosing a provider, such as a cloud provider, always require to see their uh, data on sustainability. Uh, do they have the services that you will need to track and measure sustainability and make your improvements? So always require to see that. And of course, uh, try to pick the provider that uh, helps you with the shared fate, shared responsibility efforts to re reduce energy usage and improve sustainability. So with that, let's uh, briefly talk about some of the services that we've built to help engineers uh, to uh, progress into a, a more sustainable uh, resources and sustainable uh, services. So first, uh, we call it GCP Project Lifecycle, uh, and we utilize GCP Active Assist service for that. So that comes again, the principle of turning the lights off after, you're, after you leave the room. Um, whenever you finished working with a GCP project, uh, you might want to delete it. But it happens uh, quite often that engineers forget to delete the uh, GCP project. So we built a service that allows engineers uh, to get reminders. Uh, so the way we do it is uh, with a simple uh, architecture you can see on the right side. Uh, we have a cloud scheduler that periodically through pop-up notifications awakens uh, Google Cloud functions that look and examine projects, GCP projects, and through the help of Active Assist, identify whether a project is used or not. If it is not used or if it no longer has owners, uh, we reach out to the best, next best available owner and, and we ask them to take a look at the project and see if it needs to be removed. So this is our way of assisting engineers to remove unneeded resources. Next is Compute Recommender, uh, where we look at uh, compute utilization. If a compute VM is underutilized, uh, we create a uh, ticket, it can be a JIRA or a service now ticket, and we ask engineers to uh, scale it down or scale that resource inwards, right, again, to improve uh, energy uh, efficiency. Uh, and then finally, region recommender. Uh, whenever we identify resources that are easily uh, relocatable to other more sustainable regions, such as uh, uh, storage buckets, for example, again, we can uh, come up with a ticket and ask that uh, resource owners to migrate uh, that particular resource into a more sustainable region. So let's uh, uh, finalize with uh, some conclusions and takeaways. Uh, first, we really uh, look at sustainable engineering as a shared fate model. So we need to uh, take this responsibility alongside our provider, alongside the cloud provider. Uh, we need to use their tools and uh, we need to build our own tools on top of the uh, cloud provider tools to eventually get to a uh, better place. Um, next, we want to treat it as a must-have and not just a nice-to-haves. Uh, right, nice-to-haves uh, tend to be deprioritized and tend to never get done eventually. We really need to uh, start uh, in, uh, including sustainability metrics and, and building sustainability services uh, into our own uh, uh, team projects, into our uh, yearly planning. And finally, a call to action. So uh, these services, they're not complex. Uh, you can uh, maybe take a few hours of, uh, of your daily work or maybe over the weekend, uh, take a look into uh, the tools that Google uh, Cloud provides already from the get-go that can assist you in building uh, more sustainable uh, services and sustainable uh, uh, resources.
So thank you uh, again for the opportunity and back to you, Jen. Great. Thanks, Michael. And I encourage everyone to go and check out your blog post uh, for more details. But it's really inspiring to see you've built a team, a culture, and a playbook all around prioritizing sustainability in your IT organization. You mentioned a few tools in your presentation, but I wanted to quickly reiterate a few of the ways that Google Cloud is helping users take action to make their cloud usage more sustainable. So we have the Carbon Sense Suite, where every Google Cloud user has access to detailed emissions data about your specific services and your workloads using Carbon Footprint. It's a great first step in baselining your current usage. But then you can look to make changes to reduce those carbon emissions by using our region picker and looking for lower carbon regions. And finally, you mentioned it before, but Active Assist, it's like the triple bottom line. You do what's good from a security posture perspective, from a, it's good from a cost perspective, and of course, a sustainability perspective, which is to look for those projects that are abandoned uh, and clean up the environment and reduce the, the computing waste that you might have across your organization. Hopefully, it's, it's clear that you don't need to be a sustainability expert to make sustainable computing choices. And while we've talked mostly about running computing services more sustainably, I wanted to also give you a little bit of insight in how important it is as a technologist in your organization to use technology to tackle other challenges. So I wanted to close the session talking a bit about the opportunity for technology teams to help their business tackle climate-related challenges they face in your industries. So for all of you out there who do not work at a technology company, your environmental impact is probably concentrated outside the data center like the first or last mile of your supply chain, your operations, your products, or even your investments. Cloud technology is really proving to be a great tool in addressing those challenges too. Things like geospatial data and analytics, powerful tools to identify opportunities to make your supply chain more sustainable, or the ability to crunch really large data sets and leverage AI to predict climate and weather related risks is really changing the way you can manage your infrastructure or the property you insure or even the portfolios you manage. But like we said at the start of the presentation, many executives are stuck without the right data making, to make these better decisions. So technology can really be a clear helper here. And like Michael said, it's gonna take an IT hero to just go and build it. So once again, I wanted to thank you, Michael, for joining us today and also thank all of you for taking that one step closer to optimizing for sustainability. Eric Krumholz. I am a technology fellow with Deloitte. Um, I am uh, part of the leadership team from Modern Delivery, which includes Agile, SRE, uh, DevSecOps, Site Reliability Engineering, Observability, and anything that has to do with Modern Delivery. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some work that we have done um, in, the, uh, in the automotive side. Uh, this project is for a large automotive manufacturer where we were looking at uh, enabling um, a digital backbone for the organization with the intent of modernizing the development process and break some of the silos and inefficiencies that the teams were experimenting. Uh, the, the intent of this engagement was uh, to increase the speed um, and quality of the software releases. It also included the uh, uh, enabling of collaboration and breaking silos across the, uh, the organization, uh, reducing the level of non-value activities by uh, breaking those silos again and enable, um, finding uh, ways that we could automate and avoid toil, 
and then creating an integrated uh, unified environment where um, people that were building hardware and software were able to bring things together. Uh, as an overview of the what we call the digital thread at that point and create a digital twin of the organization, uh, we wanted to uh, tackle really this in four areas. One was to enable continuity by uh, enabling CI/CD practices, including test automation, uh, all the way through the release of uh, product, increase agility uh, implementation of uh, continuous release uh, and continuous deployment, uh, accelerating the development of those releases and enabling monitoring and agile DevSecOps uh, processes. We also created uh, planning uh, and prioritization standards, uh, leveraging agile best practices. Uh, and it was intended to interact with the upstream portfolio as well as the rest of the EPIC stakeholders. And last is uh, governance. Uh, what we have de done is uh, we instituted safe uh, practices uh, to enable co collaboration and to enable uh, release trains that were able to collaborate um, across the board. And this provided uh, release-based custom practices and automated software uh, artifact exchanges. The key differentiators that uh, we had were important for this uh, delivery was the creation of uh, processes first. Uh, and, and this was really, in a way, kind of a value stream map exercise, identifying where the, um, where the gaps were, where the, some things could be automated, and where some toil was identified. And a lot of this was really first understanding the old processes and how it was done due to all the silos, and then finding a better way to connect. The second part was creating a data model to standardize the ontology language so that every part of the organization will be able to manage the information across systems and functions. We then created a series of tools and systems that were intended to simplify the ecosystem and facilitate how those tools were being deployed across multiple groups. And last but not least was to create mod modern software uh, DevOps practices uh, that were able to scale by creating CI, CD um, processes and uh, at the same time enabling a continuous improvement methodology. Uh, regarding the acceleration of software development, one of the things that we did was to really focus on enabling the developer experience. Uh, so developer experience is intended to first create um, journeys for multiple developer personas. Uh, you have all these tools, but the intent is how can you abstract this? How can you then make uh, use of these tools in the, in the easiest uh, um, way possible? So the idea of uh, creating a developer experience through a platform engineering approach is to create these journeys for each one of these personas and then enabling the assets for them uh, whether it's a developer, uh, for example, where they are able to build, test, and execute code, uh, or for a DevSecOps persona, which is able to package and release and test uh, the applications and enabling best practices, like in the case of automotive, ASPICE, uh, FUSA traceability, et cetera. Uh, some of the methodologies that we used um, are listed here. One of them is our, Dev, uh, our DevOps practice, our DevOps tool platform. We call DCP, it's our DevOps cloud platform. Uh, this is um, open source based software with a, uh, num uh, with a proprietary predictive rules based engine that allows you to build highly secure and industrialized CI CD platforms. But what it brings to the table is these out-of-the-box blueprints with best practices that we were able to share right out of the bat and enable implement integration with an ecosystem of tools and at the same time um, enabling these uh, uh, APIs to be used in your developer experience. Some other things that we use were um, the, the idea of building all these metrics uh, that we were tracking uh, KPIs across multiple teams, uh, things uh, such as Dora metrics for 
um, and they f- figuring out what was the er- their error density or understanding, you know, how did they do um, uh, their releases or accelerating those number of releases, uh, et cetera. We also help with the digital thread integration by tying the um, uh, traceability between the, the hardware and the software. We also work on the integration and acceleration of uh, releases to bridge the gap on the software the, 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 the development and the deployment. And ultimately, we were able to integrate a lot of uh, good practices to uh, integrate uh, hardware and software together, such as the idea of semantic versioning. Um, all these uh, in collaboration, all together, where we were able to also tie to other parts of the digital strategy or the dig- digital uh, release that we were able to tie on how the bill of materials were cre- being created for in, from the engineering side and then how these were being used in the manufacturing side. Some of the impact we had is uh, we were able to absolutely streamline the software development methodology, breaking down some of these silos, uh, identifying these personas, and enabling uh, uh, out-of-the-box blueprints with the right practices that were able to bring all these teams together, and also enable the right team structure to be able to enable that collaboration between stakeholders uh, in a way to help work uh, in a horizontal manner rather than sequentially. So, and, and a secondary benefits we had, we were able to create a modular uh, design uh, methodology to help maximize reuse and also to help accelerate the development of software. We were able to also uh, provide a rapid cost analysis of design and updates. And we were able to reduce the complexity of uh, manufacturing by enabling the building of hardware and software to be uh, to be taken in a unified manner. Last but not least, uh, some things to think about is to uh, when when you want to optimize developer uh, velocity is to prioritize and plan, uh, making sure that you're uh, enabling the right standards across the enterprise to inter interface or integrate across uh, the portfolio and epics. Uh, collaborate and integrate uh, by dissolving these uh, silos and providing uh, a way to work across the organization. Um, leverage proven methodologies uh, around DevSecOps um, in, the, in the way of managing the work, building, testing, and deploying the work. And then improving release agility, which is something that is a journey uh, at uh, building these uh, agile practices and, and also uh, leading these, um, these uh, ceremonies. Uh, and the use of these uh, ceremonies um, w- help with uh, you know, your continuous releases, accelerating uh, velocity for developers, and uh, helping uh, monitor your Agile and DevSecOps processes more successfully. Uh, thank you so much for the time today. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. Um, Anytime. Thank you for your attention. My name is Priyanka Vergaria. I am the Chief Evangelist and Content Officer here at Google Cloud, and I am joined by IT heroes who have created a digital ecosystem for millions of users with personalized and seamless consumer experience, including real-time conversations, like-minded communities, and many more, all through a super app. Welcome to the summit, Pablo and Naveen. Hello, Priyanka. Glad to be here in IT Heroes. Hello, Priyanka. Thanks for having us here. 
Amazing. Well, uh, with that, uh, we are also very excited to learn about this super app. Uh, Pablo, why don't we start with you? Just a little bit about you. Sure, uh, Priyanka. Uh, I'm Pablo. I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer of Asia Super App. We are an spin-off from an airline that paints the skies red in Southeast Asia, and we have been working in into a super app from 2019. Great, Naveen. My name is Naveen. I head the flights engineering team at Asia Super App. A Bangalore boy who loves listening to trance music. I'm super excited to be here today. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, Pablo, why don't you get us started with a little bit of an overview of the Super App itself? Sure, Priyanka. Uh, we started the journey in 2019. Just a little bit before pandemic, uh, we decided that uh, we wanted to do more than only sell tickets for Asia. So we started a journey uh, where we started including other airlines in our offerings. Uh, we started selling hotels, combining airlines and hotels, so becoming a travel agent uh, for us and for others. We started delivering groceries and food because of the pandemic and the lack of travel. And even we ventured into e-hailing and some fintech products. So it has been a very quick evolving and changing ecosystem in our role to be uh, a a super app and, and engage communities, right? So our mission is to connect people, uh, connect uh, places and connect lives. So uh, I, I like to say that now I can connect Penang or Bangalore to Valencia in a single itinerary where you can have a ticket from Eurasia, but you can be combined with some, some other airlines and with a hotel even. Uh, in this journey, we started uh, from the airline so we were lucky to have 50 million users database. And last year where we operated uh, halfway because the pandemic was still uh, alive from the first quarter, we reached uh, more than 10 million active users to, towards the end of the year. And this year we are trending to touch 20 uh, very soon. That is uh, such an amazing journey. And it sounds like it's now becoming uh, more than just airline. It's everyday lifestyle essentials type of brand. Um, uh, very nice to hear. Uh, how has Google Cloud helped in this journey? So at the beginning of the restart, April last year, uh, we were leveraging Google Cloud already. But we were a little bit rusty. Uh, it was a couple of years where the activity on the travel ecosystem was a little bit low. So we started stumbling a little bit the first couple of months, uh, a little bit of downtime and so on. So uh, by mid of the year, we decided that that needed to change and we needed to revisit how we were doing things uh, using Google still, but uh, to give an extra step that would get us ready for a permanent 10x capability, right? Uh, on that journey, we, we paid a visit to, to Sunnyvale. We met with the engineering teams at Google and they presented two, three options. And we decided to try first with Autopilot uh, because it gives us a broader use case and the capability of freeing some of the resources and being ready to scale in a faster way, freeing the engineering resources needed for this. Uh, another product that we saw was Cloud Run, and it's also in the pipeline to try to uh, uh, test it for some of our use cases. And that's something that we will take in the next quarters, probably. That's great. GK Autopilot sort of helps um, get started quickly in that direction. Thank you, Pablo. Um, how about we learn a little bit more about uh, business KPIs? And um, again, uh, what were you looking to achieve is um, uh, with this with this project? So the initial uh, problem statement that we had is that we tried to put a couple of things into production, uh, and when a scale came and when it started ramping up, we had to roll back the features and then start fine tuning, right? So we did see that the uh, autopilot could be a potential solution to template certain configuration to allow us to deploy features faster without this uh, roll forward, roll back game that, that it was affecting our deliveries. 
So that was the main, the main goal, right? To be able to cope with the scale and increase the speed to market because we were fast when when the scale hit, uh, we had to roll back, right? Without forgetting about security and without also forgetting to give new content and new technologies to the team to learn and experiment with. Yeah, get things done fast, fail fast, move fast, uh, iterate fast is is sort of all that's um, that you know depends on the tools that you choose. And um, sounds like GK Autopilot was was able to do that for for this particular instance. Um, so uh, now I would like to turn a little bit to Naveen you to learn a little bit more about the tech stack and the skills that were needed uh, to get on this journey. Sure, sure, Priyanka. We built the flights platform ground up that powers AirAsia flights and the non-AirAsia flights. It's a zero to one product development with an entire tribe of 50 amazing engineers and we are living our dreams and having a high octane career path. Right? We started the journey about five years back with a team size of less than 10, right? And Google App Engine is what we started with where we had a lot of mono repos, frequent Canada releases and it worked well for us back then. As we grew from one line of business to a pure play super app, uh, powering hotels, snap, rides, e-commerce, and a lot more, we had the need to scale. We had rising business expectations, and GK was our obvious choice to run containerized workloads by the funnel. From standard GK, we moved progressively to regional GK to ensure we had high availability. All this while, one thing that never slowed down was the expectations to scale 10x. To, to, to support the revenge travel demand. Frequent flash sales in the company kept us busy, uh, you know, and, and we had to contain the operational cost as well. And one of the most important aspects was to manage the talent density. We never had a very big SRE team and we had to manage the talent density, right? And autopilot was our obvious choice, which brought all of the uh, practices out of the box and obstructed the management of the infrastructure, right? We have an elegant architecture today with uh, ASM in play, uh, you know, with uh, multi-cluster uh, setup on prod, with the capability to do on-demand uh, 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 cluster creations, and as well as managing canary across clusters, right? Uh, we, have, we have kept a very high benchmark in terms of our KPIs, such as cost, performance, and reliability. So as the platform stands today, you know, we are at 2.1 million transactions per month, uh, 4.1 uh, seats being sold per month and about 350 to 320 million dollar sales per month right we are we are getting bigger and we're getting stronger and we're super happy and thankful for google to be part of this amazing journey oh we are we are th those numbers are so staggering it's it's definitely amazing to be part of uh, that journey from for, and the decisions that were made in the in the process right from app engine to uh, to to GKE and then GKE Autopilot, um, and how how all of that helps to to scale back and to sc to scale back on um, depending on the number of resources you have um, on and on and talent you have, um, and then also um, the scaling the platform at the same time. So like um, doing all of those trade offs and dealing with all of that while making sure that these these numbers of 2.1 million transactions per month, they're just staggering. So glad to be part of that journey. Um, so it, it's customers like you that that excite us to, to push these boundaries and work more uh, towards making GKE Kubernetes um, even more um, even more helpful, useful, and take away that that extra toil and extra work from you, so that you can focus on that innovation in apps like Super App. Um, and recently, these numbers are are amazing as well, and I think you can attest to them too, given what you just shared. A Forrester Consulting study found um, that users of GK Autopilot get an ROI of three hundred and fifteen percent over three years. It sounds like what you just mentioned is sort of very similar to, to those numbers. Um, so with that, I would love to uh, summarize uh, what we just went through um, in the conversation with Naveen and Pablo here. Um, we looked at uh, using the power of, of managed services. When you're using managed services, 
um, you you don't have to worry about those dev tools and run times and, and APIs because they are just being taken care of for you behind the scenes so that your business can scale. Um, and then when it comes to autopilot, we, we saw the power of autopilot um, in, in this particular app, uh, unlocking that efficiency and innovation. Um, and and uh, Pablo also mentioned uh, the move to cloud run, which is sort of that natural transition uh, from if you're thinking about going serverless and don't even want to have uh, the ability to like uh, the more nuts and bolts. That's that's how I think about these different options. The more nuts and bolts you have, you have those in GKE. But do you really need that? And that's the assessment that you need to continue to do in order to figure out um, does does uh it, my scale and my resources and all of that combined, uh, sometimes serverless is the is the best option to go with. And sometimes something in the middle like GK Autopilot is the best option to go with. So it really d- does depend on the situation and the application you're working with. But those options and knowing them, knowing when to look for those and keep uh, keep trying and, and innovating is very important. The other thing that, uh, that Naveen, you had mentioned earlier was Anthos Service Mesh, the more modern architecture Architectures we have, the more microservices we we create, uh, the more the need to uh, to use uh, a service mesh to connect those together, um, and utilizing that has been has been helpful as you as you scale these services together. Um, the the one other piece that uh, that we didn't talk much about and is very important in microservices architecture is this API management. Um, so I like to mention Apigee because. Uh, when you connect, uh, you have a ton of microservices that are new and modern, but then you also always have those legacy platforms that you have to connect with. That's just inevitable, right? And the way to do that is through um, API management tool like Apigee, which allows you to do that. And then last plug that I would mention is uh, for the teams themselves, in order to learn and grow these skills towards the new tool, newer tools and, and applications like Autopilot and Cloud Run or anything else that's required to sort of make these applications work, we've got the Innovator Plus um, offering, which is on-demand trainings and certifications and, and a community of folks uh, like us who are working um on the same types of problems across different companies coming together to sort of, uh, you know, like-minded, understanding each other's problems and then um, in technical problems that they're dealing with and then sharing sharing those. So you get that with that Innovators Plus. So it just, it's all about upskilling um, from, from wherever you are in your infrastructure to where, what skills you need in order to grow that, that application and that infrastructure. So with that, I would love to thank you, Pablo and Naveen for joining me today. And uh, thanks to you all in the audience. We, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, learning a little bit about Super App, just like I did. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the IT Heroes Summit. Thank you. Welcome to IT Heroes. My name is Abhinav Gupta. I'm a technology partner for North America's business of ThoughtWorks. Um, I'm a hands-on technologist having two decades of experience in using technology for business transformation across different industry verticals. Uh, In this journey, so far, I have worked across multiple countries in three different continents, including North America, Europe, and India. I'm here today to share our journey of reimagining the future of building software at Standard Industries. So Standard Industries approached us to modernize uh, their legacy applications and also to help them in the overall strategy to modernize 
a portfolio of uh, different applications. They were also looking for engaging, you know, a strategic partner who can really help them modernize their engineering practices and also uh, adopt, not just adopt, but also upskill their workforce on using some of the modern uh, engineering uh, practices, which can really enable them to transform uh, their business. While, uh, I mean, this was the ask, there were a number of challenges uh, that they were facing. Uh, some of them are, you know, existing uh, aging practices uh, like software engineering practices, pro project management practices, and a lot more. Uh, the application releases were, you know, quite manual. They were not really using any modern, sophisticated continuous integration or continuous deployment techniques and different maturity level of people also, like the understanding itself, you know, needed some uh, uh, working on. They had very limited development environments, you know, not the segregated environments you usually see in a modern enterprise and which was leading to, you know, some of the problems uh, in scaling uh, their applications uh, further. Uh, last but not the least, I think there was no um, repeatable approach to application modernization. And they had, you know, a lot of applications which were legacy and they were really looking for, you know, somebody to really define what good looks like, you know, build some of those foundational patterns which can really help them accelerate their modernization uh, journey. So that's where I think uh, at ThoughtWorks, uh, we took these challenges uh, head on and embarked on a 100-day sprint to help standard industries transform uh, using technology. Uh, we did this using uh, five uh, phases of uh, this program. First one, uh, pre-inception, where we spent some time to understand their uh, landscape. You know, it included the functional technical infrastructure and just the project management practices. It was just, you know, basic scratching the surface, but it helps us understand, you know, what are kind of skills we bring onto the program to really help uh, a particular enterprise. The second phase, which we call as inception, that's where we really go a lot deep. We interviewed a number of stakeholders, you know, from all uh, spheres, you know, the functional stakeholders, the technical stakeholders, the IT stakeholders. And uh, we started from the visioning exercise and also understood, you know, what was the existing uh, current uh, state of these applications and what purpose do they serve? Uh, our inception phase typically ends with a very detailed defined to be state, wherein what is that ideal state where we can take uh, this application, uh, one application or multiple applications too, along with a very detailed roadmap of how we will go about uh, doing it. The third phase, which is, I think that's where the rubber you know, meets the road, is the implementation phase, where our software teams starts delivering uh, you know, the promise of modernization. Uh, we do it using our key methodology, which what we call is as a thin slice, wherein uh, we pick a functionality end to end and starts delivering it within two uh, weeks uh, sprints. So at the end of two weeks, you really have a working software which is deployable on a higher environment as, I mean, ideally to production, but if the organization is not ready, we can e deploy it to UAT for people to experience it and give us really the feedback. So that's how like the implementation phase uh, started and we started showing them like what a modernization uh, a program looks like and something for them to see and also give us feedback if something is working uh, not not working as per their expectation the fourth phase which is the cutover and the go live phase this is where you know uh, the this modernized application reaches its uh, real customers uh, and uh, we did that i mean there are multiple phases but in this case you know we used the phased approach where we opened the application to limited users followed by you know uh, a lot more users thereafter. Last phase, I think that's uh, one of the key phases as well. At ThoughtWorks, we believe, uh, you know, leaving the enterprise in a better shape where, I mean, then when we enter. So enabling uh, standard industries to really support, in fact, we call it evolution phase, where once you deploy an application on production, its evolution starts. So, so that's the last phase, you know, which uh, comprised of this 100-day uh, sprint at in the standard industries. 
So I'm proud to share the outcomes that we realized um, uh, by modernizing uh, the ski application. Uh, with, I mean, of, obviously the latest tech stack, which included a lot of uh, cloud native services at uh, Google Cloud. Uh, and I think some of the things which we did also along the way was revamping the user experience, um, enabling some of the lean uh, agile practices, you know, like the, the sprint, the lean, the thin slice model that I was talking about. We also enabled some of the fund foundational CI CD capabilities, including, you know, infrastructure as a code, which helped them, you know, uh, spin up the resources in Google Cloud, you know, on demand, uh, spin down, you know, all those kind of uh, the new breed of engineering things. We also uh, helped, you know, enable and empower the existing standard industries people, which I think was uh, very important for a company like Standard Industries to use and not just the new practices right now, but also enable them to use and uh, utilize more advancements in technology with confidence. Um, and I think this, the one of the key outcome which I'm proud of was Standard Industries really loved and you know accepted this as a template for modernizing a lot of their other legacy applications, uh, which will really help them uh, reduce the total cost of you know, outsourcing uh, similar uh, migration projects uh, in the future. Um, as I reflect also in this journey, um, I realize you know, the application modernization um, is more than just a technology transformation program. Um, uh, we had you know, really the four key aspects uh, that really helped it being a hugely a successful program um, for standard industries as well as uh, for ThoughtWorks. Uh, so I've summarized them you know, in four steps uh, just to abstract it. The first one was, you know, along with the use of latest technology, it's very important to reimagine the business capabilities as well. You know, like the latest breed of technology uh, infrastructure, like for example, from Google Cloud or even the tech stacks availability uh, really help you reimagine uh, capabilities. And I think businesses should be open and in fact sometimes uh, you have to show some of these advancements and that build confidence with business stakeholders second i think we help them re-architect a lot of their applications uh, which i think gave them a also a confidence that it can be done uh, you know uh, without much risks like we introduce some of the practices like tdd and all which they can really see you know and confident that if their core functional uh, features are not going away. So this was another great thing and aided by, again, the, some of the cloud native concepts provided by uh, Google Cloud. Third, I think uh, the retiring the some of the features which were no more uh, relevant becomes a very important aspect because this really reduces the footprint, uh, which is required sometimes to become uh, organization more nimble and using technology for the really propelling them, you know, like uh, ahead into the future. The last, but I think the most important one, we really help them uh, reset their engineering culture. Uh, this is, I think, the most important aspect of any enterprise. If you enable uh, the people to really inculcate the engineering culture, such modernization doesn't become a point in time exercise. And this really become, you know, a, just a second nature for them to uh, adopt and experiment. And we did this, you know, across the board. So like at ThoughtWorks, the teams in India and US were hand in hand working, you know, uh, delivering this and standard industries also understood, you know, uh, if you really have a good culture, you can really go and become a global enterprise. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our experience on this journey with standard industries. I hope you gained some valuable insights to help you in your modernization and transformation journey as well. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the Google Cloud Summit. Thank you. Welcome to our session on digital sovereignty. I'm Archana Ramamurthy, 
Director of Cloud Security Product Management at Google, leading our digital sovereignty products. As organizations think about expanding their businesses globally and leveraging public cloud for their digital transformation, privacy, security, and digital sovereignty are front and center. When it comes to digital sovereignty, countries and organizations care about three things. First, the ability to have strong security and control over their data, even when it resides in the cloud. Second, to make sure that their digital transformation doesn't affect local economies because of the reliance on a foreign cloud provider. And lastly, to make sure that there are ways to protect their most important assets and data in case of a geopolitical event. So, to address all these potential concerns, at Google, we look at digital sovereignty as three pillars, all of which are important. Number one is data sovereignty. Data is the new oil, and we want to make sure that customers have full control over the location and access of their data. Second is operational sovereignty. Beyond data sovereignty, we want to provide visibility into the control and operations of the infrastructure and cloud operations. Third is software sovereignty. So in cases where there is national critical infrastructure and data involved, we understand that there may be a need at times to disconnect operations for national security purposes. Now that we've looked at why digital sovereignty is so important in today's world, let's talk to an expert from T-Systems, our sovereign partner in Germany, who lives and breathes this in their daily life. Dr. Andreas Greis, thank you so much for joining us today at the Hero Summit. It's great to have you here. Could you please take a moment to introduce yourself and your role in T-Systems? Artema, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for having me here today at uh, IT Hero Summit 23. So I'm Senior Vice President at T-Systems. I'm leading the Google Powerhouse, um, which means basically our strategic partnership on sovereign cloud. And we jointly, we create a cloud under Germany's terms, Ajana. And how are your customers defining digital sovereignty? Like when they think about digital sovereignty, what capabilities are they asking for? So Ajana, I think you laid out already quite perfectly in the introduction what it's all about. Um, but look, everybody is used to talk about security. And the other side of the coin of security, of course, is sovereignty. So our clients are talking about uh, having control over the data residency, having, uh, of course, as well, a local operations available where they know where the data is. They want to have control over encryption. They want to have uh, protection of the data against unauthorized access. And of course, they they are asking as well for an audibility, audibility, yeah, now I'm struggling with the word <laughs> to audit the really the data and the setup that we've chosen together. And I think that works that we as the systems work here as a trust anchor. And of course, in the background, it's as well about the legally required certifications, Ajana. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's so important to have a local partner help meet these requirements, even on our side, right? So partners and regions have and increase trust in the market. You understand the market very well. You're very familiar with the needs of the market. And especially with T-Systems, we have shared values when it comes to things like security, privacy, data protection. Um, and that is very important in a relationship of this sort. And then comes the whole you know, gamut of requirements around uh, regulations and having a local entity that understands the regulations, partners with the likes of Google makes this a lot more better for all of us. And ultimately, it also fuels economic development within the countries of operation as well. So thank you. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And are there any particular types of customers or industries or specific characteristics um, that actually dictate the need for sovereignty more or less within Germany? Yes, look, um, by nature, all regulated customers. So basically, the customers in public sector, but if we think about police, military services, so all those kind of customers really under regulations, of course, they are interested in, in a sovereign infrastructure, in a sovereign cloud infrastructure. Um, 
But if you look into the health area, of course, it's a bit the same. All kind of clients, at least in Germany, that have to do with social data, because that's under special restrictions as well. But Arjuna, if I look into industrial clients, which have to deal with uh, critical infrastructure, um, of course, they, they are interested as well. And basically every client that has, um, yeah, protected data and want to protect special kind of data. And even we as Deutsche Telekom, we have different clusters of data, which we really want to deal only with in, in a sovereign environment. And, and Andreas, could you talk a little bit about why it is important for these systems to have a global partner like Google to meet the requirements of all these types of customers and industries that you just talked about? Yeah, I think that's a really very good question. Look, all our clients are very demanding. And even if they talk about data protection, about sovereignty, uh, on the other side, they ask for all the capabilities um, a leading cloud platform can provide. If we only think about um, data analytics, if we think about all available AI features today. So that's, of course, what our clients are demanding on top. And I think that only works with having a partner with that leading technology as, as Google provides today and having as well this huge open source community available, innovating every day on top of the platform. And talking about innovation, I know that as part of our partnership, we're also working on co-engineering and co-innovation. Could you talk a little bit more about that aspect? Yeah. Look, I think how we created the, the platforms available, um, already that, that really worked in a co-engineering, in a co-innovation way of our two companies. So the first available platform is what we call the sovereign controls, um, where we have already additional controls on top of the, of the Google public cloud, where we provide key management, policy management and controls monitoring. Um, but we look as well in the future, having what we call the sovereign supervised cloud with much greater role in operations of sensitive customer data. Um, but that's only one part of the co-innovation. The second part is um, we look into our client needs. So it's not about only providing infrastructure and, uh, and platforms, it's as well mainly about solving client problems. And this we do jointly in a co-innovation way as well, including our clients very, very early into the discussions. And I think that is one of the key success factors we are driving jointly, Ajana. This has been really insightful. And, and to wrap things up, Andreas, what is your advice to organizations who want to get started with or accelerate their sovereignty efforts? Yeah, Ajana. I think, as always, there's nothing better to do than just getting started. Well, um, the key thing is that Sovereign Cloud is here. It's ready. The system Sovereign Cloud powered by Google Cloud truly combines some of the best technology in the world with trusted German values for data protection. With that said, I encourage really everyone to not delay any longer to move to the cloud and leverage the leading solution we have brought to the market jointly. And I'm convinced that continued delay in adopting cloud technology poses a critical risk to competitiveness. And we support the recommendation of the regulators. Perform a risk assessment on your workloads based on its outcomes. Seek to apply supplementary data protection measures. Get in contact with us to hear about how sovereign controls by the systems can meet your business and technical needs. This is the way to ensure that we can keep innovating. Very well said. And Andreas, as always, it's a pleasure hosting you. And thank you so much for taking the time today. And now that we've heard from Andreas, let's take a look at sovereign solutions that Google offers today. Our portfolio of sovereign solutions supports the various sovereignty needs of our customers, depending on the type and sensitivity of data that they are looking to bring to the cloud. So as Andreas mentioned, our sovereign controls product 
allows you to define the location of your core data. It helps you define who has access and control over your encryption keys. And you can also choose to apply GCP's core platform controls to your data. So solutions like DLP to de-identify data, confidential computing to encrypt data while it's in use in various services. The Partner Managed Sovereign Controls product adds the ability for a partner like T-Systems to monitor and control Google access to data and encryption keys, providing both visibility and control over operational elements. And I'm sure there are situations where there is a strong need to have less reliance on the software provider. And our hosted cloud offering, which is Google Distributed Cloud Hosted, which is now GA, um, allows for air gap disconnected operations without proprietary provider software to support the most sensitive workloads in the country. And finally, our forthcoming supervised cloud offering, which you know Andre has mentioned before, when it's available, will be fully managed and operated by a partner, supporting data and operational sovereignty needs for specialized and highly sensitive data. So what can you do today to be ready for sovereignty and to expand your business globally? The first thing I would say is classify your workloads. So identify the categories of data and workloads that you handle and the different sensitivity levels that are associated with those workloads. And depending on the sensitivity levels, you can pick the right solution that meets those requirements. So if majority of your workloads can be hosted on public cloud with location and access controls, then sovereign controls is your solution option. And if some categories of your workload require disconnected operations, then you know, distributed cloud hosted is your option. And lastly, leveraging trusted partners is a key success factor in truly meeting the strict sovereign needs of different countries. With that, I want to take a moment to thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to helping you meet your digital sovereignty objectives, both for today and the future. Thank you.